photography first here because we haven't been able to get that going. Um, I'm going to need a variety of colored markers today, so I'm not going to put this in the traditional like slideshow thing because I need colors. Um, so chromatography provides a method of separating mixtures. It's going to be based on polarity. So you have to look at the polarity of the substances. And it's not just, it, it's like three different things that you've got to look at the polarity of. Okay. So when you're talking about, there's three different types of chromatography. There's paper chromatography, which is the only type of chromatography that I've actually seen on an AP exam. There are thin layer chromatography and there's column chromatography. So I'm going to talk myself about paper chromatography and then I'm going to let pa Professor Dave explain a couple other ones for you. Okay. Because he just does a much better job than I do. So when you do paper chromatography, and you might have done this like in elementary, middle school with like Skittles or M&Ms. This is a real common uh, kind of experiment that they do down at that level. Um, you can also do it sometimes with uh, leaf pigments. It's kind of a cool one to do this time of year with uh, like green leaves versus um, the orange, red, all of those. And you can extract out the different colors and see what colors are. And you could actually do it with a green leaf and be able to see the other colors. It's just that the green overwhelms it and you end up because it has so much more chlorophyll. So it's kind of a cool sort of biology lab to do as well. Um, but what you have to look at in terms of polarity when you set this up is you've got to look at the polarity of the solution or the whatever material is in the liquid here, okay? You've got to look at the polarity of the whatever type of paper or whatever substrate this is that it's going to be moving up. And they call that the stationary phase, Okay, and then you've got to look at the polarity of the mobile phase, which is typically the different dyes that are that you're trying to separate. Okay, and if you are dealing with a polar substance like water, your more polar um, uh, mobile phases will be at the top because that polar water is going to carry them up further. So if you're in a polar substance, the more polar things will be up here. The less polar will be down here. In this, so these would be your less polar dyes. Because we learned that things that are polar are miscible right? We talked about miscibility and the term miscible the other day, I believe, okay? Things that are polar are miscible and other things that are polar, okay? Because they are going to be attracted to one another due to similar intermolecular forces, right? Something that's polar is going to be able to to move in the intermolecular forces of attraction are going to allow it to move up higher. Okay. So what you have to do when you're doing one of these is you will start a line here and then everywhere that one of these dies stops, you are going to put another line and you're going to measure from that starting line down here where you started. Ah, I don't like that. Um, so wherever it met the water here would be your starting line. You're going to measure from there up to wherever the dye is that you're, you're working with. Okay. So here we would, that's where we started those dyes at. Okay. And you're going to find where those are at. This, the same compound will move the same rate relative to the same solvent on different trials. Different compounds will have an at least slightly different polarity to other uh, things. And we can find out that RF factor between the different compounds. 
The more similar in polarity the sample is, the further it's going to travel. So if this, whatever this material is down here, are they saying that this is water? They don't say. So if this is water down here, then these things up here would be more polar because they're going to travel further. If this substance down here was nonpolar, then these things would be more nonpolar. All right. Um, and then the RF values. Did they show you how to calculate the RF values? No. That's essentially what you need to know for those. Okay. So now I'm going to switch over and let Professor Dave talk to you. So I've got this information about thin layer chromatography on here. We're going to let him talk and then we'll come back over to that. Um, here he is. Oh, I got to get my volume up. Hold on. Hopefully this will work for those of you at home. Let's get some feel.
This is the cool. I told you it was go away. <coughs> right in your eye. How are you doing? And you'll do this RF factor on that paper chromatography as well. Okay, so this is the same for both of these. Can't we just pause that, Haley? No, I got it. That you need to know how to do that. Okay. So you need to know how to do that. So if you want to take a second while the video is paused to kind of mark that down, you need to understand what these RF things are. <clears throat> I used to try to do a chromatography lab with this unit every year, and I could just never get very good results. I don't just it would never come out right. So I just finally gave up on it after four or five years. I know you're disappointed in me. I know. Great class. Right, Jake? Oh, yeah. I'm having lots of fun in physics. All right, Derek? <laughs> Don't you just love all the labs you get to do in Jeffrey Leiter's physics class? Of course. My favorite part. All right, good. We have a lab today, don't we?
up and he's gonna go here.
Okay, so I, honestly, I've never done either thin layer or column chromatography. I think that's like way more advanced, like college classes. So you may end up doing this in college. If you do, go back and watch his video again, okay? And maybe again and again, because it sounds like it's a pretty complicated kind of thing. Um, this is why also that labs in college are usually three hours long, because all of that stuff takes a lot of time. Um, but again, more advanced college classes are going to have you do that. So that's thin layer and column chromatography. 
honestly, I couldn't have done a better job than he did because I've never done it before. So that's why I let you just kind of watch the videos and go with that. Um, distillation is another method that we work with. Um, with distillation, remember you're taking advantage of uh, whatever things are together. You're, you're taking advantage of the fact that they have different boiling points. Okay, so something that boils at a higher boiling point is going to be left behind and the stuff at a lower boiling point is going to evaporate. This is an outer tube. It's like a sheath around this tubing that usually has cold water running through it. And because it's cold water, it's going to be at a lower temperature. It's going to cause the gas that was created over in this section to then condense here and then fall down into here as a liquid. And so that's how you're going to end up separating um, the, the two things. This is how they do um, like separation for alcoholic beverages. Um, typically, that's why it's called a still, if you've ever heard of like moonshining and stuff like that, it's called a still. Um, it also is pretty much the same idea as what refineries do to be able to refine crude oil. They just have a whole bunch of different things here and they have a bunch of different levels that stuff will eventually, you know, they just keep cranking the heat up until they keep driving off different substances. But that, that's essentially the way uh, refineries work. Um, they can also use this for desalinization of salt water. So if you're in an environment where you have salt water, you can boil the water away and then the salt will be left behind and you can drink the water because it's pure water at that point. Okay. Um, typically if the boiling points are close together, then you have to use some sort of fractional distillation where, um, you got to be very, very careful with that. Um, and then that's going to allow it, it's going to revaporize. And then you've got to keep doing that over and over again until you eventually separate everything out. Um, again, this is what the <clears throat> paper chromatography looks like. So if this was placed in water, those dyes will move up. The things that are towards the top here then are going to be more polar. Um, I'll just let you do the, we do at home so that we can move on. Um, solubility then, which is the next section, which is 310. We've already kind of talked about this, um, so I can probably hit through it pretty quickly. Um, remember that if you have something that is dissolved in something else, it's typically going to be the same polarity or similar polarity, okay? So if something's polar, polar things will mix. If something's nonpolar, then nonpolar things will mix. And that has to all do with intermolecular forces. You always have to take it back to intermolecular forces. You can't just say, oh, because it's polar. You've got to explain what that means. Okay. Um, so when an ionic solvent is hydrated, so put into water. So we have our water here. We've got our calcium chloride here. You're going to end up having the um, positive ion surrounded by the water molecules. The negative end of the water molecules will be pointed towards that positive ion. So if you were to draw this, if they were to ask you to draw this, a particle diagram of this dissolving, you would make sure that you would have one of these for every two chlorines. And then in addition to the, the oxygens being pointed to the calciums, when you draw the chlorines in, you need to have the hydrogens pointed into that because the hydrogen into the water is positive and it's going to get attracted to that negative ion. Does that make sense? So you need to make sure that your ratios are right and you need to make sure that your orientations are right. Um, water can also dissolve non-ionic substances as well. So anything that is polar, it's going to dissolve. So you would have, when you're looking at these substances, you would have your um, hydrogen in attracted to that oxygen with the little pairs of electrons on it. Because that's going to be the, if you drew out this acetic acid, the OH group on the end is the end that's going to be polar. You guys are packing up on me. You're not going to listen to me anymore. I got four. Oh, I don't have four minutes. It's Wednesday. Dadgummit. All right. So we'll pick up on this slide tomorrow.